about it the uh, too many of the people think the whole industry was always centered in uh, Toronto but the business started in Montreal at the turn of the century 1900 with, with the Berliners so it would have been 1967 Ken Middleton had left uh, RCA Canada because the record club had proven to be a big failure not due to him but be, just because the way it operated by giving away records for next to nothing and then b being unable to collect. So Ken, I, I discovered, had gone over to uh, Warner Brothers uh, to, to uh, take over their opening their first international company, which would be in Canada. Uh, the connection there was with Phil Rose, who was the uh, international guy for Reprise. Ken and he had met I guess in Montreal, and Ken got the job and opened uh, uh, Warner in 1967 uh, in Montreal, at the West Island, I think on Brunswick Avenue, if I remember correctly. And uh, they, they operated out of there, I think until 1971 when, or 70, uh, when they moved the operation to Toronto. It was, well, it was a tiny office. We, you, there was just nothing there. And our direction from the head office was close to nothing. I don't, you know, they didn't have any people. They didn't have an A&R, nor did they care about A&R. They didn't have a press man. They were kind of feeling their way too, because they had only been open a couple of years and here they are in Montreal. I don't believe Ken Middleton, the president, spoke French, so he must have been really unhappy there. And uh, I, 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 it's unbelievable how little direction I had. My training when I got there was Gord Edwards took me to meet Art Collins at CFRB, Bob Wood at Chum, Sam the Record Man. That was the morning. And then he said, okay, you're on your own. There was absolutely no material. So I started a little newsletter to go to my radio stations, showed what was getting played, etc., etc., And that was also my way of distributing stuff. For example, I knew that Gordon Lightfoot's Me and Bobby McGee was coming out, so I sent the album to all the stations saying, check out Me and Bobby McGee, it's going to be his next single. We got the scoop on that and he had the hit here. But Ken Middleton would have cut my throat if he had known I'd sent out 60 albums or whatever it was, right? Because Ken Middleton didn't spend money on anything, so I really learned how to work within a budget. I never ever had my entire budget when I was at Warner's nationally was $2,000 a month. 
Shep Gordon could eat that for lunch. <laughs> and so I would just keep spending. I wasn't supposed to, and then I'd get shit for it. But I don't have any choice, you know. We might have at any one time a dozen artists in the country, maybe more than that. Had to do something. In a way, we were creating the industry in Canada. Because they didn't have to before. They took whatever albums were coming from wherever they got them <laughs> and got them in the stores. That was pretty much it, you know, so. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, the music business was centered in downtown Toronto. Uh, all the uh, record companies had warehouses in the suburbs, which they didn't think were conducive uh, to uh, signing artists. So they all opened up uh, downtown locations. For instance, before I came to Warner's, I worked for Columbia Records of Canada, uh, who are on Leslie Street. Uh, but we had uh, an A&R office uh, on uh, Front Street, of uh, the Flatiron Building. The bottom floor of the Flatiron Building was our A&R office. Uh, when I went to Warner's, we had a, a, a house uh, on Scollard Street, uh, number 40 Scollard Street in Yorkville. When I came to Warner's in 74, um, I think our biggest selling artists were uh, Joni Mitchell, uh, Neil Young, and uh, Gordon Lightfoot. Uh, so the natural focus was go to go after singer-songwriter folkies. Uh, the first one that I signed was Ray Materic, who uh, was a very talented guy. He'd been on another label, uh, Canada. Canada, before that. And uh, it was a good album, but it just didn't have the traction. Uh, so anyway, we put some uh, money and marketing behind it and ended up with a, a fairly serious artist. An interesting side note is that his guitarist was Daniel Lanois. Well, when I joined the company in 77, uh, the place was a phenomenon. It was a juggernaut. It had a, a dominating presence in the, in the business, primarily on the back of the American repertoire. I, I think that first fall we had something like eight out of the top ten at CFTR, which was the, the big uh, top 40 station in Toronto. And closer to Christmas, I remember having a marketing meeting and we were told unless we felt something was going to go gold almost out of the box, we couldn't, we couldn't release it because we just couldn't get pressing time at the plant. It was, it was that crazy. It was crazy. Yeah, we were really, really busy. And um, as, yeah, because it was Warner, it was Electra, and it was, it was Atlantic, so it had all the, the big acts from all three of those um, distribution um, set up so yeah we spent a lot of time taking care of those artists when they came through Toronto for sure but at the same time we were you know working on developing some Canadian acts you know A&R is like uh, playing roulette you put your money on a number and and hope for the best and considering uh, Gary Muth had had relatively few turns at the wheel, I, I thought it was astounding that he had such a big uh, hit with uh, with Street Art. It was it was really something. Gary Stratichuk uh, was a very aggressive manager from Winnipeg at that time. Who uh, he managed to get uh, his calls returned regardless of what he was doing, um, and he bugged me for weeks and weeks about uh, coming to see Street Art. Uh, and he wanted me to come out west, but then, uh, as it turned out, they were playing uh, in Ontario. So I went to see them uh, at the Knob Hill Hotel, and I thought, this band is amazing. They're, uh, they're a cross between the Rolling Stones and the Who. Kenny Shields was an incredible so uh, uh, front man, and Paul Dean was an incredible songwriter. We recorded it with George Semke at Phase One, and uh, it went over budget. And one day Ken Middleton calls me into the office and says, okay, we're pulling the plug on this project. And I said, you can't do that. Said, no, 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 we're pulling the plug, it's over. I couldn't go and tell the guys that it was over. So I just let it run and I said, well, I'm probably gonna get fired over this anyway. So why don't we just finish the record? So I just kept putting the invoices in my desk and waiting. And when it was finished, everybody said, oh, what a brilliant album. So uh, Ken relented and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> Um, I have this very clear memory as a you know, 25 year old rookie marketing manager ex experience, experiencing this all for the first time, running up to Ken Middleton, the president, who was barely aware that I even worked there, and going, Ken, this record is going to happen. I was right. It was a platinum album. Um, when Bob Roper took over, uh, about a year after, he hit a 
a big one out of the park, Honeymoon Suite, uh, and that, that really changed things up at the company. At the beginning of Q107's first years of doing a homegrown contest, they always cut it down to their top 20, 25 bands. I got invited as the A&R guy to go and be a judge at one of these contests, and one song absolutely shone and stood out, and that was New Girl Now in a demo form. I come into the office Monday, start making some calls. Who are these guys? Where are they? What's going on? My first call was to the Feldman Agency at the time. Who has them? Guy named Steve Prendergast. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Make a call. Steve, Bob Roper, what's this all about? When can I come and see the band play? So we started the dance. It, it was the dawning of the video age, and I, uh, I think the album came out uh, a month or two before much music went on the air, but pretty well all the singles off that album had videos, but we didn't really know what effect that would have, and, and certainly I didn't. Until uh, one day I was walking across Young Street with Johnny D, who was the lead singer from the band, and we heard all these uh, young girls screaming like all hell was breaking loose, and we're looking around wondering what the ruckus is all about, and we realize it's Johnny. So that's when it really hit home what, what video could do. And also, it, it really uh, hit home with me that we had, you know, arguably for the first time, bona fide rock stars on the label, and that really focused everyone up uh, in domestic uh, of, of what, what could be. I had initially gotten demos from Jim Cuddy uh, when they were the hi fives. They had sent me four or five songs, one of which was Try, and at the time the band was very reggae-influenced, sort of alternative. I passed and sent them a really nice letter saying, I love the music, but very honestly, this is not sort of the style and direction that we are looking to go. If I can ever be of assistance, you have any other songs, great. I guess they reshuffled, rejigged their music, got very good, and as most a &R people, you sort of have a list of 10 or 12 bands that are always on your hit list, things you've got to go and see. And, and I kept seeing Blue Rodeo's name, and people kept saying, you got to come and see them, you got to go and see them, they're really good. And one Monday morning I was in my office and Joanne Caden came in and said, Roper, you gotta go see this band called Blue Rodeo. You're gonna hate them, but they're really good. Well, I'd always been a fan of live music. I'd been going out to see bands, you know, even before my time at, uh, at WIA, so it wasn't unusual for me to just be out there seeing music, as I would do. Um, but I did see them a lot on Queen Street during that time and I just remember being struck by how terrific their songs were, how fully formed they were and they just came off like a really, you know, I just couldn't believe they weren't a signed band type of thing. So, um, you know, I went back to the a &R guys and Bob Roper and those guys who'd already passed on them and um, as luck would have it, somebody believed me <laughs> and uh, we got, the, you know, got them out to see the band again and they ended up doing a deal with them and uh, as Kevin was saying before, it didn't start off that great. But the brilliant thing was that they were great live and people were lining up to see them. We just couldn't cross over to mainstream. We had done videos, we had put money into it, we knew we had a great ballad in the song Try still at the back, but we didn't want to release Try first because if Try becomes a hit, the band gets known for being a ballad band and that's not what they were initially. First album came out and it looked like, uh, my opinion, was the, had been the right one. The, the record fell flat, nothing going on, radio wouldn't touch the, uh, the first single. And so we came quickly with the second single, which we thought was the ringer on the album, which was of course Try. But the same thing uh, happened, radio, radio wouldn't touch it. And all through that summer, we debated every week in the marketing meeting whether to move on to the third single. But we knew if Chai uh, didn't break Blue Rodeo, chances are nothing would, and that probably would have been the end of Blue Rodeo with us anyway. They want to do another video. We can't fund it. 
it's not going to happen. So Jim Cuddy, who was working for a film production company in town, he was a, uh, um, a props guy for McWaters Van Lint, I think was, if I recall, the company. So he gets everybody at his film company to donate all their time and service. They do a video for a couple thousand dollars. John Martin, who's a Queen Street resident at the Horseshoe, uh, sees the video, is a big fan of the band, and throws it on much music. It goes into heavy rotation, and I think about four weeks later, we have a gold record. Now he hated the video, but he loved the song, and he put it in heavy rotation, just so he could personally hear it all the time. And it was in heavy rotation all throughout that summer, but still nothing going on, no sales, no radio, except near the end of the summer, something started to happen. A few secondary radio stations started adding Try. And uh, we, we did some research and found out the reason was because Canadian music directors were, were now looking at much music as a resource for their CanCon requirements. And because John was just flogging try all summer long, they were starting to pick up on it. So slowly radio started to come in. But we wanted to keep this, these few sparks going. We wanted to fan it into some flames if we could. And we, we then put together what, at least in my time, I think was the most comprehensive marketing plan we ever threw together. So Herb Forge, the branch, the branch manager for Ontario, uh, sat us all down and said, okay, what are we gonna do here? And we just started to, to throw out ideas. It was lofty and it was crazy and some of them were wacky and some of them were terrific, but we decided to come up with a promotion called the Blue Bucks promotion, where we would send radio and retail and, reta and uh, and uh, publications uh, this campaign where if they supported the act they got x number of blue bucks and if they did this they got a certain number of other ones and if they played it in store and if they wore the t-shirts they and you could collect it all and if you had a, a, a finite amount you got a, a concert or a gold record or whatever it happened to be and uh, everything started to come in we hit critical mass and then like a, a wildfire it caught and it just went boom. And Try became Try, and Blue Rodeo became Blue Rodeo. Chris Ward um, was very close with Atlanta, obviously, as we know. They had uh, brought in another friend of theirs, Dave Tyson, to help co-write and produce, and they'd done four really strong demo tracks, one of which was Black Velvet and a couple of other tunes. I heard it and went, this is fantastic. It's an obvious hit. The first time you hear that song, you know there's gold in there. Had them come in for a meeting, and at the end of the meeting, you sort of say, what are you looking for? What do we need to make the deal? And the dollar figure he put on the table knocked me back about 15 feet. I knew at that point in the history of We at Canada with budgetary scenarios and other things coming along that there was just absolutely no way the Canadian company was going to be able to put the money up that they were looking for. So I went and talked to Stan and everybody else in the building and said, what are we going to do? I knew through my discussions with Atlantic that they were looking for something in that particular place. Twin Jerem, the American VP of A&R there, has always said to me, if you hear anything that's female and really good, you let me know. So I said to Chris, would you guys be upset if I made the call to Tunge and put you guys together and see if it could work? I don't think it took more than about one listen with Tunge. He was on the phone and said, let's make this work. Black Velvet is a smash all around the country. Uh, Atlanta was signed to Atlantic and there was nothing going on in the U.S. but they were very, very aware of what was going on in Canada. When suddenly a station somewhere in the Midwest, might have been Kansas or Montana or something like that, started playing Black Velvet. Atlantic caught the spark and to their eternal credit they were able to fan it into a flame. The record caught fire and ended up selling I think 5 million copies worldwide. 
and a million in Canada. We worked it for 18 months, four hit singles. What an incredible ride that was. It was a great story for everybody around and, and sort of sort of how it worked. And they bought right in, obviously, and it hit number one, and uh, I guess they got the money they were looking for. <laughs> In the mid-90s, we were really proud of what we had accomplished in country music. The, the lasting effect that had uh, went well beyond um, what, what we had with, the, with those particular artists. Um, the first real success we had was with uh, George Fox. And I remember the story from Bob Roper. Uh, again, sitting in the office one day, a tape comes in. And it's a finished cassette artwork. It's a being sold. And it had a 399 IGA sticker on it. IGA being a grocery store. And I looked at it and I went, mm, this looks a little cheesy. <laughs> Put it on. And as you're wont to do in the daytime, you're on the phone, you're doing stuff. But it caught my ear. And I drove back and forth a couple of days playing it. Brought it up to Stan. What do you think? 20 minutes later, he went down and he said, get him on the phone. <laughs> let's see, let's find out what this is. So I called, he lived in Cochrane, Alberta. And I called and uh, a lovely little old lady's voice answered the phone. Hello. And I said, hello, my name's Bob Roper. I work for Warner Brothers, because most people in Canada have no idea what a WEA is. And I said, I'm, I'm trying to get in touch with a George Fox. Bob could hear her put down the phone and yell out the door to George who was on a tractor, Hey George, <laughs> come inside, it's the record company. <laughs> and literally a minute later I hear, Hello? It's George Fox. I said, Hello George, my name's Bob Roper, I'm from Warner Brothers, etc, etc. And that simply was the starting point right there. I showed up at the first meeting with him in a motor home. That Alex Clark, uh, who was our Calgary branch manager, uh, had gotten for me on our way out to the mountains to do some fly fishing. And uh, that was my first meeting with George, and we signed him, and I was uh, very happy at his success. He is a really uh, fine human being, among, uh, along with being a great talent. But the big frustration for us and, and with George was we couldn't move it to Nashville. We went down there with him, worked with him, but they just didn't get it. They, they thought George was too Canadian, whatever that, that was to them, too, too folky, not Nashville enough. And, and it really was frustrating. So, in, in an effort not to repeat that again, Stan and I went, went to Nashville, uh, met with them, and came up with a template of a deal. Um, a co-venture template where we would work together, um, sharing the costs, sharing the profits, um, and, and run our next country artist through that template if we found one that, that we thought was, uh, you know, was ready to, uh, ready to do that. And the last gift that Bob Roper gave to Warner Canada was Lorena McKinnon. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's sort of an interesting story, convoluted one, and all unbeknownst to Lorena, maybe even to this day. Um, at the time, our Warner uh, marketing guy was Billy Johnston. And like uh, Kim Cook, he came from once, which was a wholesaler. And Billy had kept his relationships up with a lot of the independent music stores. And uh, the Madrigal in London was one of them. It, it was run by Tom Pluman. Nash the Slash's brother <laughs> and uh, he brought to Billy's attention uh, an artist that was based in Stratford that was doing everything all by herself and uh, and that was Lorena McKinnon. But I know it was sort of at the tail end of my going through my leaving and her coming in but it was just what can we do to take you to the next level? And her comment really was, well, you sign me to a label deal, I'm gonna get this much per record. Um, I'm already doing it myself and making $16 every time I sell a record. Why should I sign with you? And I guess the story was we can give you the world. <laughs> um, 
it turned out that Bob was, was leaving the company around then. And uh, Stan handed a &R over to me. And uh, I think it, this could very well be the last thing Bob did before he walked out the door. He, he, uh, he invited Stan to attend Lorena's concert at the Winter Garden Theater in Toronto. I recall the show, uh, I, I know who was with me was my daughter. Uh, and uh, I, th I thought the venue was kind of unique as well. But I was just enthralled with the whole show. Uh, and you have to admit, it was a different kind of music uh, that labels were chasing in those days. But I was so very, very impressed and, and, and did come back to the office and say, you got, we've got to sign this act. So I had my, my marching orders. Uh, I did some research and found out that she was staunchly independent in spite of other record companies sniffing around and making offers, talking to her. And uh, a little down the road, uh, HMV uh, was opening up their flagship store on Young Street. So I, I attended the opening event. I went up to the third floor to the classical department and voila, there's Lorena thumbing through some records. So I, I walked up to her, introduced myself, said if there's ever a time where you feel you might want a record company, we would like to be that company. And I gave her my card. And two weeks later, she called. And, uh, and that was it, <laughs> essentially. And when we started selling tons and tons of records, a few years later, um, the, the mystery was still out there, particularly at, at head office in London at the time, to the extent that they sent in a senior vice president to investigate how we broke Lorena around the world. Um, now, I knew we had worked very hard, but I knew at the core of it was something really connected to word of mouth. And, and around that time, uh, Malcolm Gladwell had, had released his, his book, The Tipping Point, and the book had not tipped at that point. It was, it was just out, very few people knew about it. And someone had given Lorena one of the early copies, and she had read it, and she gave me a copy. And she said, you know, I've often wondered myself how all this happened. And this book has, is, is the only thing I've read that comes close to maybe touching on, on how, how all this came to be. So I, I read the book, and with this, when the senior VP came and asked me the question, I, I simply gave him the book and said, you know, it's, it's, it's in there. Well, wouldn't you know it, a, a month or two later, every marketing manager at every Warner company around the world received, personally from the chairman, a copy of The Tipping Point. And in effect, The Tipping Point had tipped within Warners exactly as outlined in the book. Uh, I was the connector, the senior VP was the maven, and the chairman was the salesman. And in the same way, Lorena had, 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 sort, of, uh, had sort of happened as well. One of the artists I was most proud in working with was Linda LeMay. Um, when I was given a and um, I went into Montreal and essentially cleaned out the roster, the, the, what we had wasn't, wasn't going anywhere and uh, we, we dropped just about everything we had, in fact I think everything we had except for one artist and that was Linda and that was because I went to see her at a theater in Granby and experienced something I've never seen before or since. Literally in the middle of songs people were giving her a standing ovation. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. And so we stayed with Linda. But when we went to make uh, the first album uh, directly with her, a big argument developed um, in the Montreal office. Some people wanted to go in one direction uh, with their own idea of a producer, and Linda was adamant about going in in an entirely different direction. 
And so I, I went into Montreal and, and literally had one set of people in one office and the other in the other office. Went in, went in, heard them out, went in the other office, heard them out and came out and said, I'm sorry, but uh, we got to go with Linda. So uh, we made her album and that became Y and that went double platinum in, in Quebec, which was uh, astonishing. No one in the industry thought we could break a French artist. But with that kind of success, Linda naturally wanted to move it over to France. At that point, we were coming to the end of our contract with Linda. We wanted more albums. <laughs> and she had a very aggressive manager at the time, and he had this idea of booking a, a big theater in Paris, putting Linda in there for a month. And I thought, it was crazy. I mean, no one knew who she was. And what was she going to do, play to empty seats for a month? Uh, let alone the cost of, of such a thing. But we did the deal. Um, we put up the risk money for Paris. Uh, Linda agreed to give us some more albums. And over she went. And she played in front of virtually empty houses. Uh, it was terrible until about halfway through through that month when a literary critic of great renown showed up and I think at the prompting of uh, Charles Aznavour who had uh, done a deal with Linda for her publishing he was a huge fan of hers and this critic wrote a review that Paris hadn't seen in years and from that day on you couldn't get a ticket you couldn't get close to the place and she, uh, I, think, I think she had a gold album on that one and became a, 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 huge, a huge star in, uh, in France. What, 14 albums and 4 million sales later, it, it goes to show that uh, instinct and a little faith in, in the business can go a long way. I had very little to do with Bare Naked Ladies, but um, I, I I was aware of them almost from the beginning. I got my hands on uh, a copy of that infamous independent cassette that they, they put out. And uh, I think it was a flight from Vancouver back to Toronto. And I had my bag of cassettes and I was going through them and I came across this Bare Naked Ladies. And yeah, I was astonished. I kept playing it over and over again. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was so different from, from everything else and I'd put the cassette on the armrest beside me. Well, the flight attendant came by and, and looked down and she, she asked, said, are you actually listening to Bare Naked Ladies? And I said, well, yes and no, it's a name, it's a group. She started laughing. She said, do you mind if I borrow the cassette? And I said, sure. Well, she walked it around the whole cabin and I could hear laughter erupt all through the plane that there was this guy listening to bare naked ladies and and uh, I knew then <laughs> there was no stopping the bare naked ladies yeah they were they were red hot they were an incredible band the album was loaded with hits um, and there we had them on sire complete with uh, signing at the uh, Scarborough City Hall and so Billy Johnson's the marketing manager. I'm in the promotion chair. If you remember the, uh, the green space alien from the inside of the Gordon artwork, that was me that day. We managed to uh, pretty faithfully uh, replicate that, uh, that costume and we did the entire city from stem to stern doing promotion. We still have some great photos of that time and people still talk about it to this day. From the moment I stepped foot in St. John's, I completely fell in love with the Maritimes, the, the place, the people, the music. Um, and I have to really credit Stan and Sam, the record man, Snyderman, for that. Uh, Sam talked Stan into signing the Irish Descendants, which was a traditional uh, Celtic group out of Bay Bulls, Newfoundland, just south of St. John's. and. Uh, we flew out to sign the band on the O'Brien family's whale watching boat with, with, with Sam. And we're all on the boat and we ran aground, which was probably a good thing because it, it provided a steady platform for everyone to sign the contracts that I passed around while the whales were jumping out of the water around us. But it was a hell of an introduction to, uh, to the Maritimes. 
Now, Stan always joked about the uh, the A and R community that he, he used to refer to it as the herring fleet, where you know one fishing boat might find the the uh, a school of herring, and then all the other herring boats would would ascend on the same spot and compete for the same fish. But uh, I'll tell you, Stan became the herring fleet captain when, when it came to. Uh, to all this uh, this wealth of Maritimes music out there, um, but uh, unlike some other places, we decided to go uh, more like cod jigging one at a time than than drift net fishing. And the the next line in the water was with Great Big Sea. July 1993, I start dating Jennifer, uh, who is now my wife. Jennifer was raised in Newfoundland. So, end of August, Dave Collington goes uh, to Con O'Brien of the Irish Descendants' wedding in Newfoundland. And he comes back and he says, I heard about two bands, called Cannon and Great Big Sea. So being a dutiful underling, uh, I'm heading out on a date with Jen one night and I say to her, you ever heard of this band, Great Big Sea? She reaches into her purse and pulls out a cassette of their very first album. That was Kismet. Anyway, we start the uh, investigations and it turns out that that very first album had already sold 17,000 copies, uh, all of it in Newfoundland. Smoke and fire. So we begin courting. Uh, one day I'm in my office, the phone rings, and it's Sean McCann. Hey Kim, I hear you've been checking us out. We're just looking for a little bit of help getting off the rock. That phrase is always stuck in my mind. Again, one day the phone rang. It's Louis Thomas, the band's manager. He wasn't in a good mood. He basically said, are you signing the bloody band or not? And it was a wake-up call. It was like, geez, yeah, we do want to sign these guys. Let's get this thing moving. A couple of weeks later, the band was playing Mariposa in downtown Toronto. Dave, myself, Stan, we all went down. And that performance sealed the deal. We got the, we got the, the deal done. Fast forward a little bit later. They're making the first record. Sean McCann asked me out for coffee. So we're sitting shooting the breeze. He's telling me about how the album's going. He pauses and he says, you know, we're a song short. We're thinking of covering the Slade song, Run, Run Away. What do you think of that? I remember it just hit me the right way that day. And I said, yeah, sure, give it a shot. Good call. Ended up being the first single. The video was a hit. Much music got all over it. Things started blowing up. I remember thinking to myself, man, we've got 35,000 units here. I wasn't wrong, but I was short by five or 600,000 or so. I guess Blue Rodeo's biggest, uh, biggest success was five days in July, and, and that had a, a, an interesting and complicated beginning. Um, the truth of the matter was that Blue Rodeo was burned out. They'd been together on the road for eight years, They've done four albums, and they needed a, a break. They needed a rest. Um, the other complicating factor is that was that our deal was almost up, and we wanted more albums. So, we want more albums. They need a rest. Solution: money. <laughs> so we came up with uh, what in those days was a huge advance, and it was big enough to put sweat on my brow and wonder if I'd have a job at the end of it. Uh, and, and the advance was broken down into two parts. Half would be paid upon signing the new deal and the second half on delivery of the first album. Um, well, next thing I know, they've, they've arranged for a mobile recording truck up at Greg's farm and brought in uh, a bunch of uh, their friends, musicians, and, and had their families up there. And uh, I went up for one of those days. Uh, for what became five days in July, but it was actually five days in June. I, I think it was June 24th I went up. And it was, it was magical. I, I think I got there a late afternoon, early evening. There were fireflies starting to come out and kids playing around, everyone's children and their musician friends. And, and the vibe was sort of like a, a mini Woodstock. It, it, was, it was really something. And I remember sitting on the floor of what I think was Greg's living room 
And I was sitting there with Michael Hollett from Now Magazine, and we were sitting at the feet of Basil, who was on a stool with his bass, and we were, we, we were joking with him about the Basil is God thing that was going around at the time. And to um, Basil's left was Greg on a, on a stool with his guitar, with a microphone, and beside me on my right was Sarah McLaughlin on a stool and on her other side was Jim Cuddy. And he started uh, whispering a harmony line for Know Where You Go into her ear while she was singing it. And, and Jim had been harmonizing with, with Greg forever, so he instinctively knew, knew where to go with this. And at one point, someone went outside and yelled, okay, everyone quiets, and everyone quieted down. The kids got quiet outside, and someone pressed the record button. And I don't know if I took a breath through that whole thing. It was incredible. It was magic. It was almost as if they had caught those fireflies in a jar. It was, it was really something. Paul Brandt was a partnership between myself and Randy Stark. Randy was a huge fan of country music. And I was very much in the country music a and game back then. Somehow we had become aware of a Paul song on an MCA sampler. Um, Kim Cook and I were down in Hamilton at the CCMAs and we saw Paul. We were absolutely knocked out. Um, we got in touch and started setting up meetings. We had, uh, Kim Cook and I met um, Paul down on Queen Street at a restaurant, had a great meeting with him thought things went really well, walked out of the restaurant, and there's Bob Jameson, who was the president of BMG at the time, marching in to meet with Paul as well. But we were able to sign Paul, and one of the reasons we were able to sign Paul was because Dave had taken a time to carve out with Warner Brothers Nashville what at the time was a very unique joint venture structure. So we took Paul down there, ran him through the, uh, the famous uh, Warner Nashville School of Country Music, and we got hit singles on uh, American Country Radio, a gold record down there, and Paul became a, a phenomenon. We were looking at a way to launch, um, launch Paul Brandt, and the company as a whole had a showcase out in Banff, and we brought in um, radio people and retailers uh, in conjunction with our partners uh, Reprise in Nashville. We brought in people from across North America to showcase some of our domestic acts. Um, Bill Engvall, the comedian, was our, was our host on the Friday night. Saturday night we were at a little club in, uh, in downtown Banff and we debuted uh, two acts that night. Uh, the w first one was Paul Brandt and the second one was uh, a, a Warner L.A. act called Alanis Morissette. I want you to know that I'm happy for you. I wish nothing but the best for you both. I certainly remember Alanis back in the early 90s when she was the pop princess of Ottawa. I'd seen her perform a few times, but nothing prepared me for what we witnessed in Banff in June of 1995. She got up on stage that night with her band and just blew the socks off of everybody in the room. Everybody was going nuts because it was the music, the I mean, the performance was so frenetic. It was impossible. She was confident, she was on fire, and she was a little bit angry. And I remember everybody in the room thinking, oh my God, like what the heck just happened? We were all blown away. And we knew that we were uh, witnessing something incredibly special. All that being said, I wandered over to Dave Tollington and I whispered in his ear, I'm thinking 15, 15,000 tops. And he looked at me and he went, no, this is at least a gold record. 
So that was the first time I was wrong about Linus. So being from Ottawa, I came back from convention and I had an advanced cassette and I went around to all the radio stations, newspaper, TV and played it for people, uh, but didn't tell them who it was because they would have had a preconceived notion as to what, who Alanis was all, who Alanis was. Anyways, um, most people were completely blown away by it until I told them who it was and then they were just shocked, couldn't believe it. Uh, and one station actually said that they wouldn't play it. A month after we released the record, she was playing to a sold out um, Lee's Palace. We presented her a gold record at the end of the show in a hot, sweaty uh, dressing room at Lee's Palace. As we all know, uh, the album went on to be uh, one of the best-selling albums worldwide, and it was, or is, the best-selling album ever for Warner Music Canada. Double Diamond. Uh, so the context of, of the Big Wreck is, I'd seen them uh, about a month before, um, really, didn't like them, like, at all. And went to Kim Cook, said, Kim, Birdie Breen's got this band, they're called Big Wreck, I saw them a month ago, I hated them, should we take the meeting? And Kim said, he's, you know, he's a longtime friend, um, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's got some stature, like, just take the meeting, what harm will it do? And that's, that's when the meeting happened. Bernie comes up, plays us a handful of songs on a cassette, knocks us into next week. It was one of those, oh my God, we have to have this band. And we go straight into overdrive on it because I knew it was going to be a competitive situation. So I can very clearly remember sending the music out to five US labels, inviting them to a showcase at the Horseshoe. Three of them confirmed that they were coming. And a rule of thumb I had was never let an American A&R guy out of your sight. Well, Craig Coleman from Atlantic uh, was sniffing around uh, Big Wreck, and he came up. I picked him up at the hotel. The band was playing the horseshoe, and uh, I was going to drive him down to the shoe. But he was a little late coming down, so we were a little late getting there, and I couldn't find a parking spot. So I pulled up in front of the horseshoe, let him out, found a parking spot, came in, and no common. Damn it, <laughs> I had broken my number one rule. I'd let him out of my sight. I went straight down to the dressing room, and yep, there he was, sitting with Ian Thornley. They were trading phone numbers. Um, and we were continue to talk with the band and with Craig, and Craig said, well, you know, uh, we can sign them, you can sign them, but we can't do a deal where we both sign them and I said yes we can in fact we have the deal and it's been approved at group level and I told them the Paul Brandt story and that became the deal and we signed Big Wreck and it became a uh, became a, a, a big success through that deal and if I'm not joining the dots a little too much here I think Billy Talent uh, inherited that uh, that template I remember when I was in my interview with Warner and Steve Blair was doing my interview and he said, if you could sign any band today, which band would you sign? And I said, Billy Talent. And then every time we had a meeting there afterwards and he said, what band would you like to sign? I said, Billy motherfucking Talent. Every single time. <laughs> One of the first bands that Jennifer Hurst mentioned to me when I got to Warner Music Canada and Jen was working in A&R, this band Billy Talent, who I'd sort of heard of here and there. I knew that uh, the singer worked at The Edge, um, but they'd been around for a while, but I didn't know a lot about them. The first time I saw Billy Talent, they were actually called Pez, and it was 1999, and I saw them at Ted's Wrecking Yard. And the only reason I remember truthfully, if I'm being honest, is because that same night I met George Strombolopoulos. While that was happening, this band is playing on stage and it's got this energetic, frantic lead singer that kind of has a 
I don't know what was happening stylistically. I wasn't really feeling what they were doing, but the energy was really good and Ben's energy was really good and I remembered it and I remembered him. And uh, years later, an indie label that I was working for had dissolved. During my time of unemployment, I had run into Ben at the edge. I was down there visiting a friend and we had a kind of, you look familiar, no, you look familiar. And he uh, said, well, I have this band called Billy Talent, but we used to be called Pez. And I said, oh my God, I've seen you before. I saw you a couple years ago. So uh, he said, we've got a show coming up. Why don't you come and check us out? And that was in June of 2001. One of the things that came up in a meeting was that we had committed to make some demos with him. We had done a demo deal, but it had sort of gotten on hold and the, the, the deal got overlooked in the you know, confusion and turmoil of, of, well, of me coming in and that there were a lot of changes going on in the company. And again, I think there was a, um, a moment where people didn't want to move forward on things because nobody was sure what was going to happen and what this new guy was going to do. We went ahead with the demos and then finally they set up the show for us to all go and see this young band. I was pinned against the wall. It was so guttural. It was so powerful. It was um, everything I loved about rock and roll, everything I loved about punk rock. I think the radio department was scared shitless because, you know, again, you the, the model for Canadian majors at that time seemed to be you took one or two shots a year, so you better get it right. And this was brave, and this was a little outside of everybody's comfort zone. I think in a lot of ways it was the signpost we were looking for. Jen, Steve Blair, um, you know, so, so many of the company, like, they knew there was something special here and they knew that it was a way to plant a flag and say this might be the new direction for the company. This might be getting out of, outside of a comfort zone. Um, and I was driving down a country road listening to the radio and it came on and I had all my windows down and hairs blowing. It's just like that kind of moment. I'm like, I can't even believe this is happening. My band's on the radio. This is so exciting. It became a real thing. It was like, this is going to be a thing. They're on the radio. They're going to happen. This is, this is the thing. Remember when people say, David Hasselhoff's big in Germany and everyone would go, oh, who cares? They're big in Germany. Germany's huge. Germany's massive. It's a huge market. So they blew up in places like Germany and did really, really well. And people took to them there just the same way that they did in Canada. They just, it was like they were their own band. And the label there treated them just the same way the label did in Canada. They always uh, just took them under the wing from the beginning and were really supportive. You know, Simple Plan were signed to Atlantic around the same time as Billy Talent. The first few meetings with Simple Plan, it was, they were very aware that we had this punk rock band that did cross audiences with them and, you know, came from a slightly different place, but they were worried, you know, and I remember talking to Rob and Eric about it, the, their managers, and even the guys like, the guys are going to feel like this is your priority. So that was again another like, no, 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 there's room for this. This can coexist. And having seen um, what can happen when Canadian bands sign to a US label and, you know, you may get a shot. In Canada, you get a shot at a career. In America, you may get a shot. So it became important for us to forge that relationship, to say, no, you're part of this family. You're part of what we're trying to do musically. You're, trying to, you're part of what we're trying to do culturally. It doesn't matter to us that it's you know, an arm's length signing, which is why you know, Michael Buble, when he walks into Canada, when he comes back, he thinks of this as his record company. He signed to Burbank. Most of his, all of his business dealings are down there. But he still feels that this is his spiritual home. I think my favorite Michael Bublé story, going back to the very early days, we were having a company convention in Niagara Falls. 
And so we had the hospitality suite. They stood up in front of everybody. They played two or three songs off of the first record. And it's loose, and he, I think he did a couple Elvis songs, he did uh, a couple old R&B things, some stuff from the first album. And then he stopped and he said, we've just written a new song, and if you don't mind, we'd like to play you this song. And we're like, yeah, great, go ahead. And he goes into Home. Mm, another airplane, another sunny place, I'm a lucky man, I know. But I want to go home I got to go home Let me go home Cause I'm just too far from where you are And I got to go home And you could hear a pin drop. And I'm going to tell you, Sitting here in front of you right now, I have shivers just went up the back of my neck again, remembering what it was like in that room, hearing that song for the very first time, and knowing that Michael Bublé wasn't just doing covers, he was writing a hit song that was going to be massive. And the song ends, and turn to my left, and Steve Cody's standing there, and he's got tears coming down his face. And I looked at him, and I, like, I was taken aback. And I said, buddy, it's not a beautiful song? And he looked, and he turned, and he said, and it's Canadian content. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> and I have this wonderful photo from, I think it was either in Edmonton or Calgary Junos. And it's a couple of members of Billy Talent, Buck 65, and Michael Bublé. They'd all won their first Genos that night. And I look at that picture every once in a while and think, yep, those were the signposts. Okay. I remember the first time Brett Kissel came into the office and he, uh, with his cowboy hat, into the boardroom, standing at the end, and before every song, he would tell you the story about the song, but he would tell you everything about it, tell you what specific lyrics meant, he would say who it's about, when he wrote it, where he was when he wrote it, what the date was, what he felt like. It was a super, just in every song. And then you'd listen to the song, and that connection to every lyric was so clear, and you got to know this guy. Brett walks in, and yeah, he's the nicest guy in the world, but there was an edge to it. There was a belief in himself that became infectious. And you could tell that this guy, from a young age, all he wanted to do was, was live this music, breathe this music, and become um, an artist. He just started throwing songs out. Um, somebody had mentioned that I, you know, I have a pretty deep knowledge of classic country music as well. So then I decided to start messing with him and just started throwing out songs to say, well, do you know this one? And the kid just nailed every one of them. And going from you know a, a Lefty Frizzell song to to, to Merle to uh, he just he just knew it and that was part of is this kid for real? So we sat there and after he left, it was just you know looking at Cody and looking at Kane. It was like you gotta sign this guy. It's just not a question. He just he was real deal. That came flying out of the the, the authenticity was real. The the family heritage of ranching the same land for a hundred years, the, again, deep knowledge of, of classic country, a, um, a sense of where country music was going. He had it all wrapped together. And so it was, for us, a way to get back into the country music business in Canada, again, with another, with another pole, with another signpost. Okay, if we're gonna get into country again, this is where it's going to go. You know, th this, is, this is the level that you've got to reach. And he had his own brand of beef or something, so I was like, hey, I like beef. Let's go for it. Kissel beef. Anyways. So I'm driving downtown, um, heading home, and I get a call from Ron Lapata. So, said, can you drop by the studio on your way home? My wife works for the British consulate, and we went to one of their parties or dinner parties 
and um, Erica M was there. And I had worked with Erica M previously. So I was talking to her and then her husband. And her husband starts talking to me, he goes, I know this kid, he's 15 and a half, but he's really talented. So I go, okay, cool. He goes, why don't you have him come by my studio, you know, I'll take a look, whatever. And he goes, well, I'll send you a couple of, um, a couple of YouTube things. So he sends me a couple of these clips. And there's this little kid sitting on a stool with these like tiny black Elvis Costello glasses, just singing away. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know about this kid, but his voice and artist, he just shuts his eyes, plays music and, and goes. There was a magic to his voice. If I shut my eyes, I thought there was a 25 year old guy who was singing, but there's this 15 year old kid sitting on it. So I brought him to the studio, put him behind the mic and had him sing a few songs. And I was just like, this kid's incredible. So I called at the time uh, when I was starting, uh, Steve Kane and Steve Blair and a couple other people came down to my studio and just told them, I said, okay, Scott, just go just sing your songs behind this mic and do that thing. I walk in, chit-chatting with Ron, door opens, in walks a kid. A kid. Like, he looked, at that time he was 15, he looked about 11. And I'll be honest, my first reaction was, I hate being in the kid business. You know, it was, you're gonna deal with manager parents, you're gonna deal with, especially a, a kid who looks 11, I'm thinking, has his voice changed? Like, what are we getting ourselves into? Sits down with his acoustic guitar that was way too big for him, uh, and he starts to sing. And there's something immediately compelling about his voice. He's got a really interesting voice. They took a listen to him and I said, I think whatever, and they go, cool, let's do it. So we did a little development deal. And Ron um, had a really good idea, which was, let's just let him keep growing and I'll just check in with him every once in a while. Let's give him a little bit of dough and put him in a studio. Let's let him learn how the studio works. I started setting him up with some writers. And I told him, I said, Scott, you're 15 and a half years old, right? You are a real artist. And I said, I don't think people are going to take you seriously yet, just because of your age and because of the whole thing. I said, so just have patience, but for a couple of years, you're just going to write and write. And maybe we'll put something out when you're closer to 18, 19 years old. But just have the patience, trust me. There were some, there were some moments where I would say to Ron, like, what's going on here? Like, we got to move on something like this. This is starting to feel real. Is it too? And, and Ron, in his infinite patience and, and wisdom, was like, not yet. Three and a half years later, we started getting demos of Scott Hellman. And the songs were coming in, and they were pretty good. We think we have our entry point. And by now, Scott's 17, and we think we've got our entry point. And we're about to start making the record. And then he delivers four new songs. The brakes go back on. Where did these come from? I don't think I got past the first course. And I'm like, this is it. This is who this kid is. Like, this is the definition of what this, like, he's found himself. This isn't, like, this stuff's good. But this stuff is Scott Hellman. We ended up having a meeting um, amongst ourselves in the marketing department a few hours later and just started talking about it. I was like, okay, let's start, new, let's start fresh. Let's keep our timelines and stuff, but we're talking about a whole different kind of artist now. We're not talking about a pop artist. We're talking about somebody that's got something super special about him. And let's make sure that all of our marketing is lined up with letting the world know that this is who Scott Hellman is. One of the things that I think makes Ron very good and, and helps with the reputation the company has is 
it's not one size fits all. And so the care and feeding that Scott needed, is, it, it, it's exactly what he needed. At, you know, working with an artist from the beginning, it's the journey. It's not the destination, you know, it's like when you get to the destination, the best you can do is ask for a pair of tickets, go to the meet and greet and enjoy the show. But in the journey where you get to turn people on and get, to pe get people to understand what it is that you see, that's what makes this job so frickin' special. So when I worked in record stores and my first few years working for labels, Warner Music Canada was always one of you know the, the the place that you looked at to say well why isn't everybody doing this and of all the companies around that time because there was what you know seven majors warner seemed very active and they seemed invested in, in canadian music and they were probably the one company that didn't need to be because they were such a power uh, powerful force with their international roster and coming from you know atlantic and Electra and, and, and Warner Brothers, it seemed like, oh, there might actually be a desire to build this. It's a cost of doing business. We're in Canada. We should look like we're involved. To through the 80s, where it seemed we were building artists' careers. We were starting to impact the cultural landscape of, of, of this country. And I'm in a really fortunate place, having seen what's gone before, and having grown up uh, at a time where that, that whole idea that, uh, that it sounds pretty good for a Canadian was starting to be wiped out. And I think one of the things that Warner Music Canada continues to do is to say Canadians want and deserve to hear their own voices. You know, we're not the 51st state. This is a vital and important culture that, that is made up of, of incredible songwriters, we have producers in this country that are second to none. We've got all the building blocks. And I think it's part of our duty and part of our, our role as a Canadian record company, staffed and run by Canadians that play an integral part in telling our own stories. So we have to keep developing those stories. We keep having to find those young artists and give them an opportunity to, to put their music out there to the world.